In this course, we don't assume anything beyond whatever complex numbers you might have seen in high school. So we will start with what is a complex number and give a reminder of the basic geometry of the plane r squared and show how the geometry of the complex plane is related to that of r squared. Then give a basic overview of the arithmetic of complex numbers. And finally, we will say what is a field and why the complex numbers form one. In some sense, part five is really the beginning of a university level treatment of complex numbers because chances are from points one to four, you may have seen this in some form. So let's move on with the course. A complex number we will denote by z is of the form z equals x plus iy, where x is a real number and y is also a real number. The symbol i is a very special sort of character that we use when talking about complex numbers, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, we will note that the symbol c, this sort of fancy c, is used to denote the set of complex numbers. So we could say that the complex number z is a member of the set denoted by c. This is similar to how we use this kind of r to denote the real numbers, or we use a sort of funny q to denote the rational numbers, and we use a z to denote the integers. So we need this kind of symbol c to denote the complex numbers. But Remember the equation, the quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And this formula below for x is a formula that you would have seen in high school for finding the roots of such a quadratic equation. But if you recall, there is a very special case where b squared minus 4ac ends up being less than zero. In that situation, what you have is something under the square root sign that is negative. And as we might remember, if you have a negative number under the square root sign, that is a special situation. So for example, if we have the square root of negative 4, we are told that we should consider this to be the same thing as the square root of 4 times the square root of minus 1. And this square root of minus 1 is denoted by the symbol i. So in fact, we will have 2i. And this situation is usually the first that anyone will experience the complex numbers because they will be introduced to the situation where they have to handle the square root of minus 1 and just use a symbol in place of it. As a reminder of the basic geometry of r squared, that's just the regular Euclidean plane that we would have seen again in high school and perhaps in first year calculus or pre-calculus in college. This diagram represents r squared. So what we have is an x and y axis, where the x axis is populated by the set of real numbers, and the y axis is also populated by the set of real numbers. So what happens is the set r squared is actually the set of ordered pairs, like what we see over here in this set, right? So it's a set of ordered pairs x and y, where x and y both come from the set of real numbers. And the, when we say ordered pairs, we mean that the order matters. So if you have x, y, and you switch around x and y, assuming that x and y are not equal, the result will be different. So if you have the point 2, 1, it is not the same as the point 1, 2. This is the very basic interpretation of the set r squared in a geometric way. So we see these two points, the points A and the point B, sorry, the points A and B, and these points are uniquely located on this diagram because of their x and y components respectively. And we also note that the origin is uniquely identified by the ordered pair 0, 0. The last thing that I would like to remind you about this geometry of r squared is the way that vectors tend to behave. So let's get rid of the point b for now. And in fact, I'm not going to need this extra notation for these points. So I'll just use these little x's on the diagram. Let's say we have these two points and I were to draw arrows joining these points. These arrows represent the interpretation 
location of these points from the origin using arrows so we consider them as what we would like to call direction vectors of those points so we can think of these points exactly as members of this set r squared or we could think of them as arrows when we think of them as arrows we call them vectors and when you have vectors you can have things like vector addition and vector subtraction and multiplying a vector by some scalar that is some real number Number in this case. So we learned that when we have vector addition, like in the case of these two vectors, if we want to add them, we would draw a parallelogram like this. And this point out here, let's label it. Okay, so let's label the vectors V and W. The position vector of this point out here is considered to be v plus w the vector v plus w similarly if we wanted to multiply the vector v by let's say the number two that's scalar multiplication of v by two it would just double the length of the vector v whatever that will be so these are the basic facts about the geometry of r squared that we will use for our study of complex numbers observe that the definition of the set of complex numbers is the following numbers x plus i y such that x and y are real numbers and that x plus i y is equal to a plus b i if and only if x is equal to a and y is equal to b now this looks somewhat similar to the definition of the set r squared in some ways we can do away with the symbol i and this addition sign and just take the pair x and y and consider them to be pairs in the plane r squared and plot them in the exact same way which is exactly what we do with the complex plane we take the plane representation of r squared and use it to plot complex numbers now when we use it to plot complex numbers it is called the complex plane or sometimes called the argand diagram and that idea of calling it the argand diagram is due to the influence of an amateur mathematician a swiss amateur mathematician by the name jean robert argand he was born in 1768 i don't think he was the first to think about plotting the complex numbers in this manner but this uh, complex plane and this diagram has been named after him so if we have the complex number let's say 1 plus 2i then we look at the x-axis 1 and on the y-axis we have 2 so we can put that point here and say let's call it z that is equal to 1 plus 2i now when we talk about the component 1 versus the component 2, observe that they're a bit different. 1 doesn't have an i next to it, but 2 has an i. And we call 1 the real part and 2 the imaginary part. And because of this, we label the x-axis the real axis, so the real part of z, and the y-axis the imaginary axis. So that axis gives us the component that corresponds to the imaginary part of c and with this convention we can take all complex numbers of the form x plus i y once x is a real number and y is a real number and we can plot them in exactly the same way that we would plot members of the set r squared and the same rules for vectors and so on vector addition scalar multiplication vector subtraction all of those things hold exactly the same way in this complex plane Since we have complex numbers, it makes sense to think about the arithmetic that can be used with these complex numbers, just like how we have them for other kinds of numbers. So how do we add and subtract them? It's very straightforward. It's done component-wise. So to add a plus bi and c plus di, you literally just say a plus c plus b plus d i. Same thing goes for subtraction. It's a minus c plus b minus d i how do we multiply them well it's the same thing as expanding brackets but the difference is that we have to remember a certain thing about that symbol i remember how we expand brackets okay a multiplied by c plus d i plus b i multiplied by c plus d i which gives us a c plus a d i plus bci plus 
b d i squared. But since i is the square root of minus 1, that means i squared is minus 1. So in fact, this becomes a c plus a d i plus b c i minus b d. And we group these things by real and imaginary parts. So we get a c minus b d plus a d plus b c i. So there's no need to remember the formula for multiplying complex numbers because you can just derive it yourself. Division requires something a little bit different. So remember that if we multiply a fraction, if we multiply anything by one, it stays the same. But there's more than one way to represent one. Technically, we just have to have something, let's call it x, divided by itself, and that is always equal to one. But we can choose this x in a very helpful way for this particular division. If we said that this is equal to a plus bi over c plus di multiplied by c minus di over c minus di, that's the same thing as multiplying it by one. And you get something kind of nice happening. So in the numerator, you have just a plus bi times c minus di, which is just this up here. But in the denominator, if you multiply it out by the same procedure as before, you are going to get c squared plus d squared. When you put these things together, it becomes ac minus bd plus ad plus bci divided by c squared plus d squared. And if we want to put that in the form x plus i, y, where x and y are real numbers, so in other words, we're grouping the real and imaginary terms, it's just going to be ac minus bd divided by c squared plus d squared, so that's one term, plus ad plus bc divided by the same thing, multiplied by i. So this is your real term, and this is your imaginary term. But what about the symbol i? Where does that fit in? How does that get interpreted in light of what we learned before about the complex plane and how the complex numbers can be represented as ordered pairs and so on? Well, remember, when you have multiplication of real numbers, let's say, you have something called an identity. Well, a one in this case. A one is something that when you multiply it by anything else is not going to change it. We have that for the complex numbers. It's actually a different element. It's one, zero. And you can just multiply this by the complex number x, y, and you will see that it remains the same using the procedure from before. But we have another special character, zero, one, and we consider this to be i. The reason why we do this is because if you have zero, one times itself, so zero, one times zero, one, it's actually the same thing as 0x plus 1i. I'm writing the 0 and the 1 just for the sake of clarity here, but later on I will leave it out because it's convention not to write them. Anyway, so it'll be that times itself, which is actually, it's i times i, which we know as minus 1. And if we write minus 1 in terms of ordered pairs, Remember, minus 1 is just an ordinary real number. So an ordinary real number is just the same thing as saying a complex number that has a real part and no imaginary part. So we can actually write this as minus 1, 0. So this i is used to represent the ordered pair 0, 1 that has the property that when multiplied by itself, it gives minus 1, 0. And if you were to write a complex number in the form of ordered pairs being added together, you can actually get x plus i, y is equal to x, zero, because x is real, x by itself does not have an imaginary part, plus zero, one, which is our i, 
and y is imaginary but not real. So we can write it as 0y. And if you multiplied these things out and added them together component-wise, it ends up being xy, which is just the r squared representation of the complex number x plus iy. And that's how i comes into the whole system of complex numbers. In treating the complex numbers as a formal topic in analysis, we want to think about it as a set with some structure. That means a set of elements, a collection of elements that satisfy some kind of characteristics. We call those characteristics axioms. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is a field? A field is just a set that satisfies a few conditions listed here. The set must have some kind of addition defined on it and a multiplication such that together with the multiplication it is an abelian group and that means it is closed. So if you have two elements x and y, x plus y must be in the set whenever x and y are in the set. The addition is associative so that's x plus y plus z is the same thing as x plus y plus z. There must be an additive identity, which is a zero, denoted by a zero, usually. So that's that will give you a plus zero is equal to zero plus a, which is just a for any a in this big set a here. So that means the zero doesn't have any effect on the other element when it is added to it. And all of the elements in A under plus must have inverses. So we all, all these elements have additive inverses, usually denoted by a minus sign. So the negative of that element. And what that means is when an element is added to its additive inverse, you always get back the additive identity. So the first condition is that A together with the addition itself must be an abelian group that is satisfying these four properties that I just listed out. The multiplication must be commutative, meaning that if you have x and y in A, xy multiplied by each other is the same thing as yx multiplied by each other. The order doesn't matter. Associativity is similar to what we were doing with addition in the sense that x, y, z is no different than x times y, z. Multiplication must have an identity, so it's usually denoted by a 1. So 1 times any element x and a will just give you back that element. All the non-zero elements must have inverses under the identity. That's usually indicated by a reciprocal symbol. So if you have some x and a, then you have an element 1 over x such that when you multiply it by x, it gives you back the multiplicative identity. Multiplication must distribute over addition. So things like if you have a and x plus y and a is being multiplied here, then that just means ax plus ay. And the last characteristic is that the identities for addition and multiplication must be distinct. So you must have two separate identities, one for each of these binary operations. So you must have a multiplicative identity and an additive identity. Therefore, any field has to have at least two elements. Now, what's the point of saying all of this? Remember before we talked about a multiplication defined on the complex numbers. We had an addition where we talked about adding things component-wise, and then we had a multiplication where we multiplied by the denominator, but the denominator was a little bit different. There was a different sign. What we were doing is multiplying by something called a conjugate. By those two operations, addition and multiplication, the complex numbers, let's denote that by C, together with the addition we talked about before, and the multiplication, the complex numbers are a field. Meaning that 
With these operations, the complex numbers satisfy all of these axioms. But of course, the elements of the complex numbers look a little bit different. So what are some of these things going to look like? The additive identity of the complex numbers looks like 0, 0, or 0 plus 0i. And that's easy to see because x plus iy plus 0 plus 0i is the same thing as x plus 0 plus y plus 0i, which is just x plus i y, which is the same thing. Multiplicative identity. I'm not going to do the operations for that one. You can do that on your own with some pencil and paper. It's probably a good exercise. But multiplicative identity looks like this. 1, 0 or 1 plus 0i. So when you multiply that by any x plus i, y, again, you will just get back x plus i, y. The inverse of any complex number is just the reciprocal of it. So if your complex number z is equal to x plus i, y, the multiplicative inverse of it is just 1 over z, because z times 1 over z will give you back this multiplicative identity, which can also be represented as 1, 0. So under these operations of plus and multiplication, the complex numbers form a field. And this multiplication that we talked about before on the complex numbers was observed by the mathematician William Rowan Hamilton. The last thing I wanted to mention, I forgot it before, is that the additive inverse of a complex number is very straightforward. If you have a complex number x plus i, y, the additive inverse is obtained by just making the individual components negative. So if you add these things to each other, what will happen is you get x minus x plus y minus y times i, which is just 0 plus 0i, or that's just 0, which is the additive identity. And that's all we have for this lesson. Uh, see you in the next one.